braving the weather for this exciting presentation in Martha's Vineyard Sign Language. This is Joan Nash, and she'll be speaking to you in one second. I wanted to just take a minute to thank the Multicultural Committee that paid for this event. Please show your support in them bringing more Deaf History, Deaf Studies events, ASL events to BCC. That would be appreciated. Without further ado, take it away. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I'm just going to sort of tell you my little story about Martha's Vineyard Sign Language. How many people know where Martha's Vineyard is? Excellent. Who's been there? Okay. How many people know, know where New Bedford is? Okay. So just good. <laughs> okay. So just to get a little oriented, um, Martha's Vineyard is an island off of Cape Cod. If you wanted to get there easily, you'd get on the highway, go up to 24, over onto 25, 495, head down to Cape Cod, and take a ferry, okay, for about half an hour. Um, my story starts on well, when I was seven years old, and I was sitting in my second grade classroom, bored to death, and I took out a book and started reading it inside the desk. How many people have ever done that? You've got something going inside the desk, right? And um, it was the Helen Keller book. And I got to the end of this really exciting story. And there was the alphabet, the manual alphabet. And so during the long, boring afternoon, I taught myself to fingerspell. And on the way home, I stopped at my great grandmother's house and said, great grandma, look what I learned how to do. And I fingerspelled the alphabet to her. And she said, oh, I know that one-handed alphabet, and I know the two-handed alphabet. And she showed me the alphabet in British Sign Language, which is done with two hands. And then she said, and I know all the signs. And she started to teach me sign language. I had no idea why my great-grandmother used sign language. I didn't know where, where her sign language had come from. But it right away became the secret language between me and my great-grandmother. And every time we were together, she'd teach me more signs. And we'd sign in front of my family who didn't understand anything that we were saying, like, mostly, could I have some candy? <laughs> and she would say yes, which my mother would have said no. Um, anyway, I learned this sign language. And during this time when I was growing up, there was a rubella epidemic. And lots of children were born deaf who in the past, there were just a lot of deaf children. And a lot of the deaf children had multiple handicaps because they'd become deaf through rubella. And um, there just happened to be a camp on Martha's Vineyard for children with cerebral palsy. And the woman who started the camp actually lived in Swansea. So a lot of kids from the Fall River, Swansea, Somerset area came to this camp on Martha's Vineyard. And um, I decided as a nine-year-old, that it would be a really cool idea to go and volunteer there. So I did. And that's where I first met other little deaf kids. And so I learned sign language from them. The sign language they were learning, I don't know if any of you have seen this book, but there was a book called Signing Exact English, a big yellow book that had all kinds of signs that were initialized. So for example, they didn't sign cat like this with the F hand shape. They signed it with a C hand shape. And instead of signing kitten by signing cat and then signing baby, they used the letter K in the cat sign position and said kitten. So I learned those signs. In fact, I taught the, myself those signs out of a book so that sometimes I got the orientation all screwed up. And it wasn't until years later that I learned that the sign for thing didn't actually go hard didn't, the sign for thing went like this, and I thought it went like this. Which, if you know sign language, the difference between this and this thing and being totally out of it um, are very different. Anyway, um, so I made almost no connection between my great-grandmother's signs and the signs that the deaf children at this camp were learning. In fact, I sort of thought, well, maybe the signs she knows are kind of Indian signs mixed with Boy Scout signs, because those are the other two sign language communities that I'd heard of. 
Um, and so I ended up being kind of fluent in Martha's Vineyard Sign Language that my great grandmother had taught me. And this kind of ASL mixed with initials, initial letters, sign language that I learned at camp. And then I went off to boarding school. And while I was at boarding school, my boarding school was near the Austin School for the Deaf in Vermont. And so, of course, I wanted to do an internship there. So I went there and they put me in a fourth grade classroom where the kids seemed to think my signing was fine, except that I signed Finnish with F hand shapes instead of with five hand shapes. And they thought that was a little weird and gave me a hard time about it. I quickly adjusted. And then I went to lunch and I sat with kids my own age for the first time who were fluent in ASL. And they said to me right away, whoa, you sign like a baby. And I was like, oh my God, like what do I do with this? And so I sat there and watched them for a week and I adjusted my accent. <laughs> um, and so that was when I learned ASL. And um, I went to Boston University to become a teacher of the deaf. And my freshman year, I was involved in, um, I was invited to join a research group that was one of the very first groups that was doing research on American Sign Language. Um, William Stokey at Gallaudet had started the real academic study of American Sign Language in the early to mid-60s. And, um, but as far as people really studying sign language and, and knowing what they were doing and studying it the same way in which people studied spoken language, um, this group at, in the greater Boston area was one of the first that was doing real linguistics on sign language. It was called the New England Sign Language Society and it was held at MIT, but there were people from Brown and Harvard and all over the, the greater New England area there. Um, so one of the things that people were interested in in the Sign Language Society was the origin of signs and how signs changed over time. And Nancy Frischberg, who was one of um, the initial researchers, had done a paper on how older signs were generally made with two hands, whereas the modern version of the same sign used only one hand. And I was, and they were saying, how would we find out more about this? You know, we have, we have a little data on, you know, older people using signs made with two hands and younger people doing them with one, but how would we find out anything about sign language from the past? What were people really doing back then? And all of a sudden something clicked in my 19 year old brain that said, wait a second, what is my great grandmother doing? Because her signs that I see everybody else signing with one hand, are all done with two hands. And a lot of them are quite similar. For example, most people, certainly at least in 1970, were signing cat with the F hand shape like this, like this. But my great grandmother signed it like this with what we call the baby O hand shape and two hands. Um, the same thing with the sign for cow. I had learned cow signed with two Y hands from my great grandmother. And I noticed everybody else who wasn't signing like a baby, according to the kids at the Austin School for the Deaf, signed cow like this with a Y hand shape with one hand. So I said, I think maybe these signs my great grandmother's using are not Indian signs, and they probably aren't Boy Scout signs. Maybe they're old American sign language signs. So I demonstrated for all these college professors these signs that I had seen my great grandmother do and that I knew from her. And they were like, oh wow, let's go down to the vineyard and videotape your great grandmother, N you know? And maybe we'll find out where she learned these signs from. So, great, we got an old video camera. These old video cameras were this big. <laughs> and they had reel-to-reel -reel cassette tapes that I kid you not were this big around. So you had to lug all this stuff with you and the people who came with me, unfortunately, were very terrible videographers. So we ended up with hours and hours of very blurry, black and white, but mostly gray, videotape of my great-grandmother signing. Now, when we went down to the vineyard, we had a list of signs that we wanted, that we wanted her to sign for us. And a lot of them, I'd, I'd written down all the signs I could think of that I knew from her. 
but there's also a special list that linguists use when they go in and look at a language and it's called the Swadesh word list and so we had that word list of, of signs that we were going to ask my great-grandmother about. Um, so about seven of us went down. I was the low man on the totem pole because I was 19 and everybody else had a doctorate. Um, so they sort of arranged things and, um, and my great-grandmother came and we, f we filmed her and they started right out by saying, so how do you know these signs? Well, it turns out that when my great-grandmother was growing up, in the area of Martha's Vineyard where she lived, there's a little village called Squimnocket, also and an adjoining village called Nashaquitza. And in that little tiny area of Martha's Vineyard, one quarter of the population was deaf. So my great-grandmother had learned signs because her, because people her age and older than her, there were just lots of deaf people. So um, her husband was a very fluent signer. His best friend um, had a deaf father. He, his brother was also a very fluent signer and they were known to sign all the time. But no one ever told me that any of these people whose names I knew had been deaf. So she starts telling me, telling me stories that I know I've heard before, but I didn't know that the characters were deaf. Um, so for example, she told me this story about one-armed Ben. One-armed Ben was this amazing guy who when he was 12 years old got his hand cut off in a threshing machine, but he was so good at still at shooting, um, at shooting ducks that he once shot a hundred times and got a hundred ducks. Um, he was able to row because he built himself a harness to put his, the stump of his arm in so he could row, and he was just this fantastic guy. Oh, by the way, he was deaf, but she never told me that part. Um, so she showed us the signs that she could remember at that time, and, and we also added on some later. But while I was talking to her, I realized, wait, great grandma, who else knows sign language? Well, it turns out her son, my grandfather, knew sign language. So we went and we videotaped him, and he told us some more stories. Um, and demonstrated the signs that he knew, which weren't exactly the same signs that his mom knew all the time. Well, then we went and he said, but you know what, you know who remembers even more signs is my best friend. So he went and videotaped his best friend, who it turned out knew a lot of the same signs in common, but then a bunch of other signs that hadn't come up. And then when I later asked them, my, gra my great grandmother and my grandfather didn't remember those signs. So. Um, so we took all this back and I transcribed the videotapes, which, you know, in, in sign language class, you know, you sit, you, you watch the video and you try and write down everything that people said. And then you try and decide what, you know, hand shapes they were using. And it took a long time. It's much, much easier now, now that we have computers that <laughs> didn't have back then. Now that you have video in color that you can stop, pause, like we had no pause. It was, it was very different. Um, so that's how I got into this whole thing of studying Martha's Vineyard Sign Language and seeing what it was about. In the process of this, um, some other people who are interested in marriage patterns in early New England villages also looked at my data. One of them ended up transcribing some of the stories and using them in a book of her own without attribution, which was kind of an issue. Um, but when her book did come out, Martha's Vineyard Sign Language became a really big thing. People got very interested in it. So I'd like to tell you what we found out about Martha's Vineyard Sign Language and the community of deaf people who lived on Martha's Vineyard. So the first, oh, what I should also let you know is my family's lived on Martha's Vineyard since 1658. So. There's, there were a lot of stories that went back very far in time that, you know, that are anecdotal, that aren't necessarily written down. Um, but when we were able to, you know, through their stories, we knew who to look at. And then um, Harlan Lane, who's a professor at Northeastern University, who's done a lot of research on genealogy, the genealogy of deaf families in New England, was able to find out 
all the names of the people and, and, who, and verify who really was deaf and, um, and who their relatives were and was able to figure out whether people were deaf because they had dominant genes for deafness or had um, recessive genes for deafness, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, um, so here we were with this data and we started looking back and seeing you know, where, where this sign language came from. Um, so the first person we know of who was deaf on Martha's Vineyard was named Jonathan Lambert. We know that he was deaf because he was written about in a, a famous man who wrote, who kept a very famous journal, um, Samuel Sewell, um, was from, um, from England. And he came and visited the vineyard and was very offended because this guy in the carriage that picked him up didn't talk. And later he was told, oh, the reason this man didn't talk to you is because he's deaf. That was Jonathan Lambert. Um, Jonathan Lambert lived on the vineyard in the 1600s. He had two children who were deaf and I think five children who were hearing. In his will, he leaves books, um, beds, houses, and various things you know, to, his, to his progeny. He, um, so we assume, since he's leaving people books, that he was able to read. We know that he signed his will with his own name. So here we have this pretty well-educated deaf person on Martha's Vineyard in the 1600s. Who knows when the first school for the deaf in the United States? Anyone know when the first school for, in, for the deaf in the United States was, stat, was set up? Ish? Yeah in the 1800s. So how come there's this guy 200 years before who already knows how to read and write? Where did he learn to do it? So we assume, you know, it seems logical. Here, here he is, he's in this deaf family. He must know sign language. Um, did, you know, why did my great grandmother know the two-handed alphabet from Britain? Did he bring it with him from there? You know, or was it someone else? Anyway. Um, so we, ha so we have these connections that we know. Jonathan Lambert came from England, came to Cape Cod, ended up on Martha's Vineyard, was deaf, had deaf children. And from there on, there was this population on the vineyard um, where, where I think, you, you know, right now you expect one out of 100,000 people to be deaf. And there it was, um, it, for the island as a whole, one out of 1,000 people were deaf. But as you kept moving further and further to the more rural end of the island, the population got more and more deaf. So in the town of Chilmark, which is, you know, look, look at relative size here. This is the town of Chilmark. And one out of 50 people are deaf. But if you're in this one area I was talking about before, Squimnocket and Nashaquitza, a quarter of the people were deaf. So, People wonder, you know, does that mean people were marrying their cousins? It doesn't really. It just means that they were marrying in a t very tiny gene pool, which happens when you're in a place where it's very difficult to travel. So, for example, on the vineyard, though, if you've been there, you know, if you go from the most populated end of the island, Edgartown, up to Aquina, which used to be called Gay Head, it takes you about half an hour. But in the old days, when travel was by ox cart, on rutted roads, it would take you all day to get from Gay Head to Edgartown. Consequently, people never did that. In fact, at, at the time that my great-grandmother was growing up, more men in Chilmark had been to China on whaleboats than had been to Edgartown. So it was a very different kind of world back then. Anyway, um, so. The people in Chilmark, uh, the people on the vineyard, in, at one time, all the people on the vineyard signed, as far as we can tell, both hearing and deaf people. Um, but because the more populated areas of the vineyard were visited by, um, you know, by whale ships and tourists and one thing and another, the gene pool there was much more diverse than it was at the very rural end of the island, where people tended to marry people from the same area of town, not even just from the same town but from the same area of town. Um, so um, 
skipping along to the skipping along to say the early 1800s, um, no one really knew that that this population was on the vineyard, and but the people on the vineyard didn't think there was anything extraordinary about it because everyone signed, everyone had a reason to sign, um, and there were there was nothing in that community where you really had to hear. As, as long as everybody signed, because there weren't any telephones. So you couldn't expect anyone, you know, there wasn't any problem with, oh, you can't use the phone because you're deaf, because nobody could communicate with anyone else without seeing them. Um, so everyone just went along together. And there, we found out that like everyone on the, vi all the deaf people were literate, even when some of their brothers and sisters were not. People made, a, made an effort to teach their deaf children to read and write. Um, and that was back in the days when children didn't, were normally taught at home until they were old enough to go to school. So it was your job, as, you know, for example, as a mom, to teach your kids their letters and how to sound out words and, um, you know, and how to count and do basic arithmetic before you sent them off to school. And apparently that's what must have happened with these kids. When the American School for the Deaf was started in, in Hartford, Connecticut in the mid-1800s, the, um, all of the eligible young men and women from the vineyard went, went to that school. Um, they weren't in the first group of deaf kids who went to the school, but there were some people who had lived on the vineyard, and as you know, they they took up too much as they were sort of running out of farmland to distribute to you know all the sons. Some some families moved to New Hampshire or to Maine, and those groups of deaf children from those deaf communities went to the American School for the Deaf. Now, who remembers who started the American School for the Deaf in Hartford, Connecticut? All right, Thomas Hopkins Gallaudet was a, a minister who had a little, there was a little girl who was his neighbor who was deaf, and he really wanted to teach her how to read and write, but he didn't know how to do it. So he, he um, talked with her father about, you know, how are we, how are we going to educate her? And, um, and the father said, I'll send you off to England. You can learn how to teach the deaf and come back here and start a school for my daughter and, and teach her. So he went off to England. And as it turned out, the people in England didn't want to show him their secrets of teaching the deaf for free. They wanted him to pay them, and he wasn't into that. So um, it just so happened that some people from the School for the Deaf in Paris, including Lorraine Claire, a deaf man who was the best teacher of the deaf at that school, um, were, they were giving a demonstration of how well they had taught their deaf students to, um, to write from, from sign language, and they invited Thomas Gallaudet to come to Paris and learn to be a teacher of the deaf there. So he went to the Paris school, spent a few months, literally just a few months, learning sign language and learning how to teach deaf kids, managed to convince Lorraine Claire to come back to America with him and start a school for the deaf, which they did. Claire was fluent in French sign language, which as you may know is very similar to American sign language for the reason that the first school for the deaf in America was started by a deaf man who used French sign language. But as the years went on, Claire kept complaining, you know, I brought these beautiful French sign language signs to America and these mm, kind of savage Americans have ruined my signs. They keep changing them. One of the ways in which they were changing them and one of the reasons they were changing them was because they already had their own sign language that had come, possibly started in England, we don't know, but at least the British alphabet and the British alphabet came to Martha's Vineyard and was used for a while. Um, and then grew up as a language on Martha's Vineyard and then moved also to Maine and New Hampshire. And, um, and then came to the American School for the Deaf, where it all mingled together and became Old American Sign Language, where 
people signed cow with two hands. <laughs> okay, so, um, so people kept coming back and forth, going back and forth between the vineyard and the American School for the Deaf. Um, but most of the people on the vineyard, unlike people who came to the American School for the Deaf from other places, most of the people on the vineyard, when they came back to the vineyard, married hearing or deaf people from the vineyard rather than marrying someone deaf that they met at school. In fact, of all the students who went off to the American School for the Deaf from the vineyard, only one actually ended up not coming back and moved up to Maine with her husband. Um, and in the other direction, only one student from the American School for the Deaf who wasn't from the vineyard came back and married someone on the vineyard. And in fact, she was brought back to marry the hearing brother of her, of her friend. <laughs> so um, on the vineyard at that time, they didn't consider deafness to be any different than like, oh, do you have blue eyes or brown eyes? Are you deaf or are you hearing? It really doesn't matter. Um, in, in the time of the, mem of the real memories of my great grandmother and my, and my grandfather, um, the town was still like that. When if you went into the general store in the evening, everyone was signing. If, um, if, there, if everyone in there knew sign language, there wouldn't be any speaking. If, um, if there were, it was a mixture of deaf and hearing people and somebody, and there was someone from away who didn't sign, they, may, they may, might also speak at the same time. There was a lot made of how, what a great signer my great-grandfather was because he could have a, one conversation speaking and one conversation signing at the same time. I think that's apocryphal, but you know, he's my great-grandfather, so I'm going to give him credit. Um, there was also, there were all different ways that they used sign language, the hearing and deaf, but one way was when they were too far apart to yell or communicate in, any, in another way, they would take their spy glasses and sign to each other. So sometimes, you know, someone wanted the attention of a hearing person, they'd ring a bell and the, deaf, the hearing person would look up, get a spy glass and see what they were signing from far away. Um, even down in my father's generation, there are some signs that they consider gestures, but we know to be signs that they use when they're communicating between boats. So if they're out, you know, lobstering, and um, my, my uncle, you know, resigning, you know, it's really windy. I can't see the swordfish fins at all, you know, and no idea that this swordfish sign was a sign and not just some gesture that had popped up in his head, but something that people had been using for hundreds of years. Though, as it turns out, only on Martha's Vineyard. That wasn't a sign that, that became part of American Sign Language. Um, other, other notable things that they did, um, it, when they were in the general store telling jokes, the, even if it was just hearing men all telling jokes, they would you know, be telling the joke. And if this was one where the punchline wasn't appropriate for the delicate ears of women and children, they'd be telling the joke, blah, 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 blah. <gasps> we're going to say something we don't want them to hear. They'd make a circle and they'd sign the punchline. So um, the, the deaf children on the vineyard, in, there were a few cases where children who lived in, um, in the more populated towns attended the, some of the small private academies that were there. But the kids who lived up island all went to the American School for the Deaf. Um, and some of them didn't go till rather late. It, it, it was very common then not to accept students at a school until they were at least 12 years old. Some people actually started formal schooling at the age of 20. Um, so it was, a, it was a wide range. Um, for some reason, the, the families with deaf students, with um, deaf children, were the families that had the most money in town. And they were the ones who could actually afford to send their kids away and work, whereas most people you know, could only afford to let their kids go to school when they were really little and they didn't need their labor. Um, but, but, all the, but most of the people on the vineyard were able to go to school for five or six years, which was really unheard of at the time. And a lot was remarked on how 
um, all these people came back and were able to do things like read the newspaper and, you know, and be well informed and participate in all aspects of the town life. You know, they, they participated in town meetings and they participated in church. Um, what was interesting was the pe some of the people who, the people who lived in town, none of them were professionals as in, um, you know, everyone was a farmer or a carpenter or a fisherman. And the doctors, ministers, teachers, all lived on other parts of the island and came up to Chilmark. So they didn't necessarily know any sign language. And those are the, the cases in where there would be people interpreting. So for example, in church, um, one of the, um, the wives of one of the deaf men usually was the interpreter. But no one explained to the minister what was going on. And if there was a visiting minister, they never told them what was going on. So um, one time my, my great grandmother remembers having this um, substitute minister, a, a young man who I guess was just starting out preaching. And, um, and he came over to dinner after, after church at her house. And she said, well, how do you think the sermon went? And he said, well, I thought everyone was very attentive, but, but there was one woman down there who was, she was very nervous and her hands kept going like this. I was like, oh, <laughs> she had no idea. He, he had no idea that he was preaching to a congregation that was one quarter deaf and that, there, that she was using sign language. Um, and apparently there was, um, there was one doctor who both of his uncles were deaf, so he knew enough sign language to as they say, get by. But if he really wanted to have a conversation with his patient, someone needed to interpret. Um, and my grandfather was asked, did the teacher have a sign? The, apparently, the deaf kids in, in Chilmark never went to the public school there. And uh, he said, oh, not that she ever knew. <laughs> so um, we, got, we heard lots of stories of people who signed in, in class and, um, and told secrets. and all sorts of things like that, that they weren't supposed to be doing. And, um, but my, my grandfather said, yeah, the, uh, the teacher just thought we were really nervous. And that's why we were moving our hands like that. Um, there's, there's one really slightly evil story about my great grandfather who, um, he was, my great grandmother was in the hospital in New Bedford. And, um, and I guess she was there for weeks on end. And, he was told, you can't come back anymore because every time you come, you talk to her, you get her all riled up and she can't rest. And he said, okay, okay, I'm gonna go in this time and I won't say a word. And he didn't say a word, but she was just as riled up as she'd always been because of course he signed all the gossip to her. <laughs> so um, anyway, so those are, those are the main stories. Um, I want to show you a little bit about what Martha's Vineyard Sign Language looked like. When, um, when we started analyzing it, the first thing, well, the first thing I wanted to know as a 19-year-old who had to write a paper about this was um, what hand shapes were used in Mar on Martha's Vineyard Sign Language as opposed to what we now use in American Sign Language. Um, when, when I first looked at this, the sort of canonical number of hand shapes in American Sign Language was somewhere between 30 and 40. Um, now, when I'm doing more precise research on hand shapes in American Sign Language, I'm up to 84 distinctive hand shapes, and that really doesn't cover all of them. Um, but back then, when we were just looking at sort of 30 or 40, um, I looked at what hand shapes were used in American Sign in, um, Martha's Vineyard Sign Language, and most of the hand shapes that we collected were very basic hand shapes. So most of them um, are going to be out of this sample. Uh, we, this is what we call them then, G, O, B, S, C, and five. And that covered just about every sign, except for um, we had the complex hand shape X and the con complex hand shape R. But other than that, that was all that was used in that, lang in that language. Though, with the caveat that all these people who I was videotaping were quite old. 
and they had varying degrees of arthritis. And so, you know, it's sometimes hard to tell the difference between a five and a C. There might be this in between hand shape where, where the knuckles are bent. Yeah. Okay. Um, so then looking at um, how, so there are many fewer hand shapes in Martha's Vineyard Sign Language in the sample that we collected than, than there were in American Sign Language, and way fewer now that I've discovered more. Um, the, then the next thing that I looked at was what hand shapes are you allowed to use together? For example, um, you can't use two complex hand shapes in a sign. If you, for example, had the sign, the letter K and the letter R, you couldn't make them do something in a sign. Whereas if you have two S hand shapes, there are a lot of things they can do. You can sign coffee. You can sign bicycle. You, um, crash. OK. Um, so what I discovered for when, for, Mar for oops, sorry, for American Sign Language, in general, most signs, if they're two hands, um, and they have different hand shapes. One of the hand shapes has to be a really easy hand shape from the G O B S C five or um, section. And then, it, but in Martha's Vineyard sign language, if you had two hands that two hands with a different hand shape, you had only two choices. It had to be the other one hand had to be G or it had to be B. That was it. Um, otherwise, if two, there are two hands in a sign, they have to be exactly the same. Um, what else? Oh, um, then I wanted to look, of course, at syntax and how you put sentences together in sign language. But I got very few, there were very few sentences that I actually got on videotape that you could see well enough to make any, to make any comments about. And the ones that I did see, we're mostly in English word order. So my great grandmother told a story about how she was out Mayflowering, which is something we don't do anymore. But it used to be that on the first day of May, everyone out, went out and picked flowers and tied little bows around them and hung them on people's doors. Um, she was out Mayflowering. And she'd been told by her husband that Mr. Jared Mayhew, who was deaf, was going to come by and that she should tell him that there was some codfish over in the boathouse for him. And so one of the sentences that we have is, so my husband told me to tell you over at the boathouse, there's a codfish for you. OK. Um, just as we would, just in the same word order that we would have done in English. Um, but my great grandmother and my, um, and my grandfather's best friend said, you know, the deaf people were very, very keen. They could see differences in the signs that we couldn't see. And they were able to sign a whole sentence with one sign. So they were clearly able to, you know, they knew that there were people who, that there was different syntax, that there were different, that there were signs that were modified by very small differences, that people who are very fluent in a language would know that someone who just has a basic, you know, hi, how are you kind of conversational sign language wouldn't know. Um, I want to show you some of the signs that are unique to Martha's Vineyard Sign Language. Um, some of, the, some of the things about them, it, what's interesting about some of them is that some were used by one group of people and not another. And it's sort of interesting sociolinguistic twist here. Um, for example, the names of fish. The sign for fish was the same sign we have in ASL, fish. Um, but the fishermen, when they signed the names of different kinds of fish, used different signs than the people who only saw the fish on land used. So for example, the sign for codfish was this, hauling in the nets. The sign for codfish used by people who were going to chop it up and cook it was this, 
codfish because there's this piece of flap that hangs down from the throat of the codfish. Okay. The sign for, um, for swordfish by the people who went fishing was this. And this is one of the signs that we got some really wonderful stories using only one, using only one sign and using these as classifiers where boom, the swordfish went away and it plummeted because we'd hit it with the harpoon and it went through death throes and then bleh, was dead on the surface and we hauled it in. Um, so this was the sign used by fishermen. It was really important to be able to tell the difference between some, the two fins on the water, which meant it was a swordfish and valuable versus doo -doo 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 -doo. one fin on the, on the surface, which would mean it was a shark. And sharks were not valuable back then. They are now, but <laughs> they weren't then. And you didn't want that one. Um, the, um, but the sign that people on land used for a swordfish was, I mean, what's the most salient thing about a swordfish? Exactly, the sword. So they just used, they just used a sign that meant the swordfish's sword. Um, other signs that they used, this is a sign for scallop. This is this, you'd only know it if you were, if you see them in the water because this is how they swim. Um, scallop, codfish, boo, 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 boo. Oh, um, the, the, other, the other shellfish signs are really lobster, not surprising. Um, I'm blanking on something else. Uh, we'll get, it'll probably come to me in a minute. Um, all right, other signs that people used. This is a sign for twins. Two of them rolling around in there. <laughs> okay, and this is, this is the sign we use for twins now. I, some people do it with a V hand shape and, or a two hand shape, and some people do it with a T hand shape. Um, this is the sign for cranberry. And this shows how you pick cranberries when you're in a cranberry bog. If you don't have a harvester, which of course we didn't, you'd get your bucket and your waders and you'd wade out in the freezing cold water. And I know because my grandmother made me do this. Um, and you'd have your bucket and you'd flick them off the stems. Um, sorry, I really thought I had this list memorized. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so I'm going to stop right here and, um, and open it up to questions. Are there any uh, uh, deaf artists that are on the island that you know of back then? Painters? <laughs> Unfortunately, no. Um, I, we don't have, we really don't have any artifacts um, of a, really anything of theirs except for the houses that they built that are still standing. Um, we have a couple paintings that were done by a famous artist, Thomas B. Um, good job, Joan. Um, Thomas Hart Benton, um, who was a famous artist out in St. Louis, but also, um, but also spent the summers on the vineyard. And he did some very famous portraits um, that are actually hanging in the National Gallery. Um, but there's, no, there's nothing that the, deaf, that the deaf people made themselves. We don't have any sketches. Um, we don't have any letters or anything like that. I, um, my father just recently, about six months ago, found a journal that his great great uncle kept, and I now know that that the pe a lot of the people he mentions in the journal are deaf, but he never says anything about them being deaf or anything about sign language. Though he'll go on and on about well, Mr. Jared Mayhew came over and visited. We had a lovely time you know, blah, 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 all the town gossip that they went over. 
but you would never know that any of these people that he mentioned were deaf because he never says anything about it. Yes? That's a very good question. Um, the, what happened was that more and more people from away started coming to the vineyard, and so the gene pool expanded. Most of the people who lived in the town of Chilmark had a re recessive deafness, so it, it would skip generations. Um, and, but if someone came into, in, on, into the town who had, um, who had who maybe had no genes for deafness or had a recessive gene for a different kind of deafness, they wouldn't have deaf children. One of the interesting things that I found when I was putting together pedigrees was, ooh, if I had married <laughs> Donald Nitsche, our chances of having deaf kids would have been about 50-50. You know, um, but since I married someone from Cambridge, Mass, no. Um, but for my, father's, my grandfather's generation was really the first generation where people were marrying people from away. And, um, and everyone in my father's generation married someone from out of town. My father married someone from New Jersey. So that's, that's what happened there. Um, the population of, Chil of you know, our little town right there was 400. Um, the year-round population actually isn't much more than that now. But, you know, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't think about just marrying the person down the road anymore. Yes? Okay, so um, I might have missed it just because I came in a little late, but how did you go about, like, researching the different signs? Like, how did you find the oh. 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 This doesn't come back on if you just wave your hands? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you're asking how I found out about it? I'm sorry. Well, like, how did you, like, find, I don't know how to word this question, like, how did I find people? Yeah, how did you find people that still knew old signs? My great-grandmother had taught me sign language. But I didn't know where her signs came from, and I wasn't creative enough or smart enough to realize she must have known deaf people. So, um, so when I was um, studying sign language at Boston University, and, and people were talking about, you know, how would we ever find out what old signs were, I realized that the signs that my great-grandmother had been teaching me were old signs. And so we went back and interviewed her. Um, and then. But I thought she was the only person who knew any of them. And then as we were talking with her, we realized, oh, well, you taught my grandfather signs, so let's go film him. And, you know, and then he'd say, oh, but you need to talk to my friend. And, um, and 20 years later, actually, my sister and I went and interviewed my grandfather's younger friend, who we thought wouldn't have known any signs at all. And it turns out he knew a whole lot because his best friend's um, mother's housekeeper was the last deaf woman in town, and he, and he knew, learned a lot of signs from her. And um, like, he, he knew all the kind of signs for playing cards and um, various domestic things. Yes? Was it harder for you to learn new signs? No, actually, you, I think you missed this part, which was um, when I, I learned, I learned um, sort of educational signs at a camp where I was, and then, um, and then when I went to the um, Austin School for the Deaf in Vermont for an internship when I was a, when I was a teenager, um, the older kids looked at me and said, you sign like a baby. And I was like, oh. And so I watched them really carefully. And after a week, I'd adjusted my accent and my uh, hand shapes. Like, I used to sign, I signed car like this, you know? And how do you sign it if you're a grown up? You know? It was, so it was pretty easy, actually. To, um, to switch over. Yeah. I mean, I, mean, I was lucky because I'd, I mean, I'd gotten, I had all these signs from my great grandmother that were already sort of internalized. And then, um, and then I had, you know, all this grammar that I'd gotten from, um, from kids at camp. So it wasn't, it wasn't too hard. I'm sorry, also, because I was like, what was the type of deafness? What, 
how, how did that come about genetically? Most, it was mostly recessive deafness. There was one family that had dominant. Because I'm reminded of a, uh, an island in, um, oh gosh, I can't remember where it is, uh, Cuba or around that area, where colorblindness was the same kind of thing that uh, explorers that were colorblind, you know, mated with the people there and left them colorblind. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot, there are a lot of little tiny communities, little tiny isolated communities where there are individual sign languages like this. I mean, I'm not entirely convinced that, you know, that Martha's Vineyard sign language just started from nothing there. I'm, I'm pretty sure that it, that it came from England. Um, but it's, re it's really hard to know because a lot of the signs that you look at that would be the same would also be gestures that hearing people use that could be the same. Like, for example, you know, French sign language, American sign language, and British sign language all sign drink and all sign eat. Um, and, you know, and you could just think like, well, maybe, you know, everybody in the world does it that way, but they don't. Um, did you have a question? No. I'm sorry, I can't see you all the way up there. The last deaf person from the hereditary group of deaf people died in 1952, which was six years before I was born. Um, the inter one of the interesting things about this sign language was that the people, the hearing people in the community did not use sign language with anyone else in the community who became deaf um, or who moved into town and was deaf. Instead, those people who came in were very socially isolated. Um, you know, some people would try and talk with them, but most people ignored them. There was um, a young man who lived in, I think of him as a young man, because he died before he got to be old. Um, he, um, who was in the, the um, Wampanoag part of the island, Aquina, which was then called Gay Head. Um, he was born deaf and went to the American School for the Deaf. And all these people who had used sign language when they were children did not use sign language with this child. And, um, and nobody used any Indian sign language with him. And he was very, very isolated. Um, though he went out fishing with people, um, he, didn't, he didn't really become part of the community and know what was going on. Out of prejudice? No, not out of prejudice, just out, just out of, um, I think, just out of awkwardness. Like, um, because then one, once I started doing research about sign language, everybody got back into, into it again and thought it was cool. Um, but it just, didn't, it just didn't occur to them, I guess. Yeah. My own question. So do you think, it seems the signs that you showed us today that were recollected are very iconic. They look like what they are. They're either descriptive or sort of handling classifiers. Do you think? That's indicative of what Martha sign language, Martha Vineyard sign language was, or what hearing people in their later years would tend to remember. That okay. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean there were there were there were some abstract signs. It's just that like nothing's coming to mind at the moment. But there were there was evidence of more abstract signs as well. Yes. If you go to, if I go to Martha's Vineyard now, because I've been there and I have never heard this before, <laughs> so is there a place to get more information about it? If you, if you go to the Chilmark Free Library, it should be if you go to the Chilmark Free Library website and you click on <laughs> um, um, Deaf Community, you should be able to get all my research materials, which I have made open to anyone. Um, unfortunately, the site has been down since December, and I call every week and say, please, please, please put it up again, because people want to see it. Um, but if you go to the Chilmark Free Public Library, um, all my transcripts are there, all my videos are there, and you are welcome to do with them what you will. Um, there's also a collection of just about everything that's been written about Martha's Vineyard Sign Language. And um, some of it is fiction, some of it is very well-researched fact, and, um, and some of it is fiction that was taken to be true. So you have to be very careful if you go look at this stuff, um, because 
there are some reports written by middle school kids of real, they, they looked at, they read fiction and then they wrote about it as if it were truth. Um, and there um, are newspaper articles from the early 1900s that just get everything wrong. And then there are things from the 1800s that get everything right. So you just have to be really careful when you look at it. But all my data is there. And like Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like Wikipedia, buyer beware. Well, thank you so much for coming, Joan. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs>